Hi, I'm Rob Bernstein, and I'm here to talk about celebrating inclusion with those on the autism spectrum, the Bernstein Cognitive Method. And I want to start with my mentor, I, Ignacy Goldberg, and he spoke about the evolution of social activism. So it's, it's great having kids be part of the regular population, whether it's art or music or lunch, but he saw this in a broader sphere. He talked about it as a movement, really, going back to the 70s. And he got, he was really pissed off at one thing, and that was when he tried to get tickets to the opera, he had to beg and plead for an aisle seat because he had a wooden leg. He lost his leg in the wall, in the war. And uh, he just didn't think it was right. He felt the system should accommodate, or as Wolfensberger said, normalize. Wolfensberger had the, the normalization principle, which basically says just this, that if, if you have the disabled coming into the norm, to the uh, natural world, to the everyday activities that we all do and appreciate as a whole, then we should, these disabled people should not be embarrassed. It should be seamless. We should have a few seats in the theater for the visually impaired, and center seats uh, for the visually impaired, or the aisle seats for people who can't bend a leg. I mean, we got the wheelchair thing down. But we're talking about an, an attitudinal change, a systematic change. So any method that engages the person in the world of everyday activities, it's another way to foster inclusion. And in order to understand the Bernstein Cognitive Method, I need to talk about what it's not. And I think that will help understand what it is. So. Briefly, we have B.F. Skinner. You might have heard of the Skinner box. And there's a rat in the Skinner box there. He was called the father of behavior modification. And he would take the Skinner box. There's a grid, it's hard to see it, under the rat. And, um, and the rat would press a lever. And when, you press, when he presses the lever, he'd get rewarded with a pellet. And that would increase the behavior of pressing the lever. You could see the cartoon. Um, and uh, so the, the, the definition of a reinforcer is something that increases the frequency of behavior. So he developed this model. It's a reward and punishment model. There's an electric grid there he used for, for punishment. And there's a joke outside of my university's professor's door um, where I went to a behavioral school. And he had this joke where one rat is saying to the another. Now you have to picture that. There's a graduate student putting the pellets down every time he presses the, uh, the bar uh, to reinforce his pressing the bar. And he says, have we got this guy trained? Every time we push down the lever, he gives us food. And there <laughs> really is some truth in that. So as a general schematic, um, we have the behavior approach changes behavior directly. You have the behavior. You have the uh, label, or you measure it, and then it, then you do the reward punishment thing, and and you change behavior. I mean, the medical model works great with this, right? You have a diagnosis, uh, label, drug, change, it works. The Bernstein cognitive approach changes what's underlying the behavior. So you have the behavior. You see how the mind works. You change how the mind works, and that in turn changes the behavior. So it's a behavioral approach, it's just a different way of getting there. <clears throat> now, here's an example just to drive the point home in a, in a simple way, in a, because when this mother's kid came to me with a problem that he was having trouble with, it was a problem with the Pythagorean theorem, he, um, he couldn't do it, and after a while I asked him, like, what's going on? He says he has these interfering thoughts. I said, wow, if we could calm those thoughts down, then what do you think? He said, great. So I got a yoga teacher coming in, calm the thoughts down, work with him for about 20 minutes, give him another example like what we're doing, no problem. But here, this is, this, is, this is the point. I asked him what was going on. 
for four years, nobody asked him in the school system what was going on. From 12 to 16, I saw him when he was 16, from 12 to 16 years old, what happened? He couldn't do the, what he's being asked to do. And I learned this in graduate school. If you give a kid something that is too difficult, apparently, what do you do? You give him something easier. So he, so he was given something easier and easier and easier until he landed in a class for the intellectually disabled. And he was just screaming, I don't belong in this class. He's, he's trying to get into college and take the college entrance exams. But the point here that, like I said, uh, understanding the underlying cognitive process, how about just asking the kid? That's, a, that's a, a, uh, an, an example of what, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> the Bernstein Cognitive Method uses real life situations to elicit language and behavioral change from within, from within the person. So that's, that's the key here, one of the keys to the method, using real life situations to elicit this kind of change from within. And I want to talk about this girl who would water the plant, a plant every time she would come. And one time I put out all the water, no water in it. And she looks, looks at it, apparently thinking, but, you know, and what do I say? I've done this many times and people have told me, say, uh, does it need water? What do you think? Should we get water? Why should she use your words? Why don't give her the opportunity to have language surface from within herself? And she's looking at it, I'm saying nothing, and she says, empty. The mother was beside herself. It was, that's one of the, if not the first word, one of the first words she, she, she ever said. Empty. It connected her. It connected her affect. It connected her to language. And after that, she really started to talk a lot more. So that's an example of using these, these real situations to enhance language. Um, so I just want to go back to the book where called Uniquely Normal, but I want to go back to the subtitle, Tapping the Reservoir of Normalcy to Treat Autism. That's, that's, that's what we're talking about. Tapping the reservoir of normalcy, normalcy, getting that to surface to treat autism. So here's a brief outline of the entire method. It works to understand how a child's mind works, not just the behavior. It observes and see patterns of behavior which represent what? The underlying thought processes. And then it looks for gaps in the developmental process. And we'll talk more about gaps later. In order to methodically bridge the gap, real situations are set up which will elicit language, relating, communicating, and so forth. So let me give you an example, and we'll play these clips of here's a child with no language in the beginning. There are three clips here, and you'll see bits and pieces of each one. In the beginning, there was no language, and then after a few weeks, you'll see the change, and after several months, maybe 10 months, I don't think you could tell the difference, difference between her and a, and a typical kid. So let's have a chance to, to look at these slides. Turn. What do I do? Say push it. Tell me. Push it. I do it. Push it. Push it. Say push it. Say push it. Let me. You say it. I do it. I do it. Push it. Say push it. Julia, who should open the bottle? You open it, Rob. Who should open the bottle? Julia, who should open the bottle? Who should open the bottle? You open it, Rob. Who should open the bottle? You, Bob. 
up. Okay, I'm gonna open it. Who should open the bottle? Who do you want to open the bottle? Hmm? Who should open it? Do you want to open it, or should I open it? I'll open the bottle. Okay, yeah, okay, go ahead. You open the bottle. He's really stuck in here. He needs stuff. It's he, he needs someone's help. For what? For he needs his friends back. He needs his friends. How about this one? How about this one needs help? Why does he need help? Because he needs to get out and swim now. He needs to swim. So now I want to talk about Neil. Now, Neil's a kid. Um, let's talk about his developmental gap. He didn't want to, he doesn't recognize something from another person's viewpoint. Boy, is this common. Friend comes over, that friend could only do what Neil wants to do. Very common with autistic kids. So. Let's see, how do we bridge that gap? So the following situation I used to bridge the gap, I brought him to a local restaurant and um, Stacy, the owner, came, came over and said, whoa, I, I see you have a boot on your foot. I, I broke my foot a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't figure out a position to sleep in. Could you tell me what position works for you? He says, nothing. Now what do many of us do in a case like that, whether a teacher, a parent, a therapist, what do we often do? She's asking you a question. Answer her, right? Here's the problem with that. Kids learn what they're taught. And now, they're taught to answer the question, but in your mind, answer the question meaningfully. You're not teaching him that. You're just teaching him answer the question. And as you know, these kids are pretty literal. So he's learning to answer. How many times have we been with these autistic or Asperger's kids and they'll answer or respond to you, but it's, what they say is totally irrelevant. We teach that. We teach that to these kids because we, we insist on them to answer the question. So I say nothing. Stacy waits, I don't know, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, walks away. I say to Neil, I say, you know, Stacy thinks you're not friendly. And he says, I don't, I don't understand. I didn't say anything. <laughs> I, you, right? I, 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 I tell him what any, everybody here would say for the next 10 or 15 minutes, how, well, I know you didn't say anything, but, you know, she's asking you a question and blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, that's the 10 or 15. He gets it after 15 minutes. And then what do I do? I call Stacy back. And I don't care, you see, about the answer to that question. I don't care about the behavior. I care that he changes from the inside. I care that he wants to be res more respectful or more considerate or more responsive. I don't, so she does come back and I don't remember exactly what it was, but he was responsive. So I'm fine with him thinking about, well, when the next person comes with a question, maybe I don't want that person to feel that I'm not friendly, this may work for him, and I'll be thoughtful and responsive and, and uh, communicative. So we have these three situations, and there are direct ways to use real life situations to get results. Two we use the illicit language, and the other, understanding another person's viewpoint. The whole point is doing this through real life exercises, rather than just telling the kid what to do. So the cognitive, the Bernstein cognitive method gives the child the skills to recognize a similar situation and transfer his real life training to successful interaction, like we're talking about Neil 
if he comes across a similar situation like that. In conclusion, the idea of the Bernstein cognitive method for treating autism, it's a matter of understanding the child's thought processes with an attitude of systematic change and societal inclusion. Thank you. You're welcome to um, contact me uh, during the session, after the session. I'd love to hear from you. Email me, text me, call me. Thank you.